Section 17 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Section 17. The Story of Allah ad -Din, or The Wonderful Lamp, Part 2. Allah ad -Din remained in this state two days, without eating or drinking, and on the third looked upon death as inevitable. Clasping his hands with an entire resignation to the will of God, he said, There is no strength or power but in the great and high God. In this action of joining his hands, he rubbed the ring which the magician had put on his finger, and of which he knew not yet the virtue. Immediately a genie of enormous size and frightful aspect rose out of the earth, his head reaching the roof of the vault and said to him what wouldst thou have i am ready to obey thee as thy slave and the slave of all who may possess the ring on thy finger i and the other slaves of that ring at another time allah ad -Din, who had not been used to such appearances would have been so frightened at the sight of so extraordinary a figure that he would not have been able to speak but the danger he was in made him answer without hesitation, Whoever thou art, deliver me from this place if thou art able. He had no sooner spoken these words than he found himself on the very spot where the magician had caused the earth to open. It was some time before his eyes could bear the light, after being so long in total darkness. But after he had endeavoured by degrees to support it, and began to look about him. He was much surprised not to find the earth open, and could not comprehend how he had got so soon out of its bowels. There was nothing to be seen but the place where the fire had been, by which he could nearly judge the situation of the cave. Then, turning himself towards the town, he perceived it at a distance in the midst of the gardens that surrounded it, and saw the way by which the magician had brought him, Returning God thanks to find himself once more in the world, he made the best of his way home. When he got within his mother's door, the joy to see her and his weakness for want of sustenance for three days made him faint, and he remained for a long time as dead. His mother, who had given him over for lost, seeing him in this condition, omitted nothing to bring him to himself. As soon as he had recovered, the first words he spoke were, pray mother give me something to eat for i have not put a morsel of anything into my mouth these three days his mother brought what she had and set it before him my son said she be not too eager for it is dangerous eat but little at a time and take care of yourself besides i would not have you talk you will have time enough to tell me what has happened to you when you are recovered it is a great comfort to me to see you again, after the affliction I have been in since Friday, and the pains I have taken to learn what was become of you. Allah ad -Din took his mother's advice, and ate and drank moderately. When he had done, Mother, said he to her, I cannot help complaining of you for abandoning me so easily to the discretion of a man who had a design to kill me and who at this very moment thinks my death certain. You believed he was my uncle, as well as I, and what other thoughts could we entertain of a man who was so kind to me, and made such advantageous proffers? But I must tell you, mother, he is a rogue and a cheat, and only made me those promises to accomplish my death. But for what reason neither you nor I can guess? For my part, I can assure you, I never gave him any cause to justify the least ill-treatment from him. You shall judge yourself when you have heard all that passed from the time I left you till he came to the execution of his wicked design. Allah ad -Din then related to his mother all that had happened to him from the Friday, when the magician took him to see the palaces and gardens about the town, and what fell out in the way till they came to the place between the two mountains, where the great prodigy was to be performed. How, with incense, which the magician threw into the fire, 
and some magical words which he pronounced, the earth opened and discovered a cave, which led to an inestimable treasure. He forgot not the blow the magician had given him, in what manner he softened again, and engaged him by great promises, and putting a ring to his finger to go down into the cave. He did not omit the least circumstance of what he saw in crossing the three halls and the garden, and his taking the lamp, which he pulled out of his bosom and showed to his mother, as well as the transparent fruit of different colours which he had gathered in the garden as he returned. But though these fruits were precious stones, brilliant as the sun, and the reflection of a lamp which then lighted the room might have led them to think they were of great value, she was as ignorant of their worth as her son, and cared nothing for them. She had been bred in a low rank of life, and her husband's poverty prevented his being possessed of jewels, nor had she, her relations or neighbours, ever seen any, so that we must not wonder that she regarded them as things of no value, and only pleasing to the eye by the variety of their colours. Allah ad -Din put them behind one of the cushions of the sofa, and continued his story, telling his mother that when he returned to the mouth of the cave, upon his refusal to give the magician the lamp till he should get out, the stone, by his throwing some incense into the fire, and using two or three magical words, shut him in, and the earth closed. He could not help bursting into tears at the representation of the miserable condition he was in at finding himself buried alive in a dismal cave, till, by the touching of his ring, the virtue of which he was till then an entire stranger to, he, properly speaking, came to life again. When he had finished his story, he said to his mother, I need say no more, you know the rest. This is my adventure, and the danger I have been exposed to since you saw me. Allah ad -Din's mother heard with so much patience as not to interrupt him this surprising and wonderful relation, notwithstanding it could be no small affliction to a mother who loved her son tenderly. But yet, in the most moving part, which discovered the perfidy of the African magician, she could not help showing, by marks of the greatest indignation, how much she detested him, and when her son had finished his story, she broke out into a thousand reproaches against that vile impostor. She called him perfidious traitor, barbarian, assassin, deceiver, magician, and an enemy and destroyer of mankind. Without doubt, child, added she, he is a magician, and they are plagues to the world, and by their enchantments and sorceries have commerce with the devil. Bless God for preserving you from his wicked designs, for your death would have been inevitable if you had not called upon him and implored his assistance. She said a great deal more against the magician's treachery, but finding that whilst she talked, Allah ad -Din, who had not slept for three days and nights, began to doze, she left him to his repose and retired. Allah ad -Din, who had not closed his eyes while he was in the subterraneous abode, slept very soundly till late the next morning, when the first thing he said to his mother was that he wanted something to eat, and that she could not do him a greater kindness than to give him his breakfast. "'Alas, child,' said she, I have not a bit of bread to give you. You ate up all the provisions I had in the house yesterday. But have a little patience, and it shall not be long before I will bring you some. I have a little cotton which I have spun. I will go and sell it, buy bread and something for our dinner. Mother, replied Allah ad -Din, keep your cotton for another time, and give me the lamp I brought home with me yesterday. I will go and sell it and the money I shall get for it will serve both for breakfast and dinner, and perhaps supper too. Allah ad -Din's mother took the lamp and said to her son, Here it is, but it is very dirty. If it was a little cleaner, I believe it would bring something more. She took some fine sand and water to clean it, but had no sooner begun to rub it than, in an instant, a hideous genie of gigantic size appeared before her, 
and said to her in a voice like thunder what wouldst thou have i am ready to obey thee as thy slave and the slave of all those who have that lamp in their hands i and the other slaves of the lamp Allah ad deens mother terrified at the sight of the genie fainted when Allah ad deen who had seen such a phantom in the cavern snatched the lamp out of his mother's hand and said to the genie boldly i am hungry bring me something to eat the genie disappeared immediately and in an instant returned with a large silver tray holding twelve covered dishes of the same metal which contained the most delicious viands six large white bread cakes on two plates two flagons of wine and two silver cups all these he placed upon a carpet and disappeared this was done before alla ad deen's mother recovered from her swoon alla ad deen had fetched some water and sprinkled it in her face to recover her whether that or the smell of the meal brought her to life again it was not long before she came to herself mother said Allah ad deen do not mind this get up and come and eat here is what will put you in heart and at the same time satisfy my extreme hunger do not let such delicious meat get cold his mother was much surprised to see the great tray twelve dishes six loaves the two flagons and cups and to smell the savoury odour which exhaled from the dishes child said she to whom are we obliged for this great plenty and liberality has the sultan been made acquainted with our poverty and had compassion on us it is no matter mother said alla ad deen let us sit down and eat for you have almost as much need of a good breakfast as myself when we have done i will tell you accordingly both mother and son sat down and ate with the better relish as the table was so well furnished but all the time Allah ad deens mother could not forbear looking at and admiring the tray and dishes, though she could not judge whether they were silver or any other metal, and the novelty more than the value attracted her attention. The mother and son sat at breakfast till it was dinner time, and then they thought it would be best to put the two meals together. Yet after this they found they should have enough left for supper, and two meals for the next day, when Alla ad deens mother had taken away and set by what was left, she went and sat down by her son on the sofa, saying, I expect now that you should satisfy my impatience and tell me exactly what passed between the genie and you while I was in a swoon, which he readily complied with. She was in as great amazement at what her son told her as at the appearance of the genie, and said to him, But son... What have we to do with genie? I never heard that any of my acquaintance had ever seen one. How came that vile genie to address himself to me, and not to you, to whom he had appeared before in the cave? Mother, answered Alla ad deen the genie you saw is not the one who appeared to me, though he resembles him in size. No, they had quite different persons and habits. They belong to different masters. If you remember, he that I first saw called himself the slave of the ring on my finger, and this you saw called himself the slave of the lamp you had in your hand. But I believe you did not hear him, for I think you fainted as soon as he began to speak. What? cried the mother. Was the lamp, then, the occasion of that cursed genie addressing himself rather to me than to you? Ah, my son! Take it out of my sight, and put it where you please. I will never touch it. I had rather you would sell it than run the hazard of being frightened to death again by touching it. And if you would take my advice, you would part also with the ring, and not have anything to do with genie, who, as our prophet has told us, are only devils. With your leave, mother, replied Allah ad Deen, I shall now take care how I sell a lamp which may be so serviceable both to you and me. Have not you been an eye-witness of what it has procured us? And it shall still continue to furnish us with subsistence and maintenance. You may suppose, as I do, 
that my false and wicked uncle would not have taken so much pains, and undertaken so long and tedious a journey, if it had not been to get into his possession this wonderful lamp, which he preferred before all the gold and silver which he knew was in the halls, and which I have seen with my own eyes. He knew too well the worth of this lamp, not to prefer it to so great a treasure. And since chance hath discovered the virtue of it to us, let us make a profitable use of it, without making any great show and exciting the envy and jealousy of our neighbours. However, since the genie frighten you so much, I will take it out of your sight, and put it where I may find it when I want it. The ring I cannot resolve to part with, for without that you had never seen me again. And though I am alive now, perhaps if it was gone, I might not be so some moments hence. Therefore, I hope you will give me leave to keep it, and to wear it always on my finger. Who knows what dangers you and I may be exposed to, which neither of us can foresee, and from which it may deliver us. As Allah ad Din's arguments were just, his mother had nothing to say against them. She only replied that he might do what he pleased. For her part, she would have nothing to do with genie, but would wash her hands of them, and never say anything more about them. By the next night they had eaten all the provisions the genie had brought, and the next day Allah ad Din, who could not bear the thoughts of hunger, putting one of the silver dishes under his vest, went out early to sell it, and addressing himself to a Jew whom he met in the streets, took him aside, and pulling out the plate, asked him if he would buy it. The cunning Jew took the dish, examined it, and, as soon as he found that it was good silver, asked Allah ad Din at how much he valued it. Allah ad Din, who knew not its value, and never had been used to such traffic, told him he would trust to his judgment and honour. The Jew was somewhat confounded at this plain dealing, and doubting whether Allah ad Din understood the material or the full value of what he offered to sell, took a piece of gold out of his purse and gave it him, though it was but the sixtieth part of the worth of the plate. Allah ad Din, taking the money very eagerly, retired with so much haste that the Jew, not content with the exorbitancy of his profit, was vexed he had not penetrated into his ignorance, and was going to run after him to endeavour to get some change out of the piece of gold. But he ran so fast, and had got so far, that it would have been impossible for him to overtake him. Before Allah ad Din went home, he called at the baker's, bought some cakes of bread, changed his money, and, on his return, gave the rest to his mother, who went and purchased provisions enough to last them some time. After this manner they lived, till Allah ad Din had sold the twelve dishes singly, as necessity pressed, to the Jew for the same money, who, after the first time, durst not offer him less, for fear of losing so good a bargain. When he had sold the last dish, he had recourse to the tray, which weighed ten times as much as the dishes, and would have carried it to his old purchaser, but that it was too large and cumbersome. Therefore he was obliged to bring him home with him to his mother's, where, after the Jew had examined the weight of the tray, he laid down ten pieces of gold, with which al Adin was very well satisfied. They lived on these ten pieces in a frugal manner, and Allah ad Din, though used to an idle life, had left off playing with young lads of his own age ever since his adventure with the African magician. He spent his time in walking about and conversing with decent people, with whom he gradually got acquainted. Sometimes he would stop at the principal merchants' shops, where people of distinction met, and listen to their discourse, by which he gained some little knowledge of the world. When all the money was spent, Allah ad Din had recourse again to the lamp. He took it in his hand, looked for the part where his mother had rubbed it with the sand, rubbed it also, when the genie immediately appeared and said, What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave, and the slave of all those who have that lamp in their hands, I and the other slaves of the lamp. I am hungry said Allah ad Din, bring me something to eat. 
the genie disappeared and presently returned with a tray the same number of covered dishes as before set them down and vanished alla ad deen's mother knowing what her son was going to do went out about some business on purpose to avoid being in the way when the genie came and when she returned was almost as much surprised as before at the prodigious effect of the lamp however she sat down with her son and when they had eaten as much as they liked she set enough by to last them two or three days as soon as alla ad deen found that their provisions were expended he took one of the dishes and went to look for his jew chapman but passing by a goldsmith's shop who had the character of a very fair and honest man the goldsmith perceiving him called to him and said my lad i have often observed you go by loaded as you are at present and talk with such a jew and then come back again empty-handed i imagine that you carry something which you sell to him but perhaps you do not know that he is the greatest rogue even among the jews and is so well known that nobody of prudence will have anything to do with him what i tell you is for your own good if you will show me what you now carry and it is to be sold i will give you the full worth of it or i will direct you to other merchants who will not cheat you the hopes of getting more money for his plate induced alla ad deen to pull it from under his vest and show it to the goldsmith who at first sight saw that it was made of the finest silver asked him if he had sold such as that to the jew when alla ad deen told him that he had sold him twelve such for a piece of gold each what a villain cried the goldsmith but added he my son what is past cannot be recalled by showing you the value of this plate which is of the finest silver we use in our shops i will let you see how much the jew has cheated you the goldsmith took a pair of scales weighed the dish and after he had mentioned how much an ounce of fine silver cost assured him that his plate would fetch by weight sixty pieces of gold which he offered to pay down immediately if you dispute my honesty said he you may go to any other of our trade and if he gives you more i will be bound to forfeit twice as much for we gain only the fashion of the plate we buy and that the fairest dealing jews are not contented with alla ad deen thanked him for his fair dealing so greatly to his advantage took the gold and never after went to any other person but sold him all his dishes and the tray and had as much for them as the weight came to though alla ad deen and his mother had an inexhaustible treasure in the lamp and might have had whatever they wished for yet they lived with the same frugality as before except that alla ad deen dressed better as for his mother she wore no clothes but what she earned by spinning cotton after their manner of living it may easily be supposed that the money for which alla ad deen had sold the dishes and tray was sufficient to maintain them some time during this interval alla ad deen frequented the shops of the principal merchants where they sold cloth of gold and silver linens silk stuffs and jewellery but oftentimes joining in their conversation acquired a knowledge of the world and respectable demeanour by his acquaintance among the jewellers he came to know that the fruits which he had gathered when he took the lamp were instead of coloured glass stones of inestimable value but he had the prudence not to mention this to any one not even to his mother one day as alla ad deen was walking about the town he heard an order proclaimed commanding the people to shut up their shops and houses and keep within doors while the princess budir al badur the sultan's daughter went to the baths and returned this proclamation inspired alla ad deen with eager curiosity to see the princess's face which he could not do without admission into the house of some acquaintance and then only through a window which did not satisfy him when he considered that the princess when she went to the baths would be closely veiled but to gratify his curiosity he presently thought of a scheme which succeeded it was to place himself behind the door of the bath which was so situated that he could not fail of seeing her face 
Allah ad Deen had not waited long before the princess came, and he could see her plainly through a chink of the door without being discovered. She was attended by a great crowd of ladies, slaves, and eunuchs, who walked on each side and behind her. When she came within three or four paces of the door of the baths, she took off her veil and gave Allah ad Deen an opportunity of a full view. As soon as Allah ad Deen had seen the princess, his heart could not withstand those inclinations so charming an object always inspires. The princess was the most beautiful brunette in the world. Her eyes were large, lively, and sparkling. Her looks, sweet and modest. Her nose was of a just proportion and without a fault. Her mouth small. Her lips of a vermilion red and charmingly agreeable symmetry. In a word, all the features of her face were perfectly regular. It was not therefore surprising that Allah ad Deen, who had never before seen such a blaze of charms, was dazzled, and his senses ravished by such an assemblage. With all these perfections, the princess had so fine a form and so majestic an air that the sight of her was sufficient to inspire love and admiration. After the princess had passed by and entered the baths, Allah ad Deen remained some time astonished and in a kind of ecstasy, retracing and imprinting the idea of so charming an object deeply in his mind. But at last, considering that the princess was gone past him, and that when she returned from the bath her back would be towards him and then veiled, he resolved to quit his hiding place and go home. He could not so far conceal his uneasiness, but that his mother perceived it, was surprised to see him so much more thoughtful and melancholy than usual, and asked what had happened to make him so, or if he was ill. He returned her no answer, but sat carelessly down on the sofa, and remained silent, musing on the image of the charming Budir al Budur. His mother, who was dressing supper, pressed him no more. When it was ready, she served it up, and perceiving that he gave no attention to it, urged him to eat, but had much ado to persuade him to change his place, which when he did, he ate much less than usual, all the time cast down his eyes, and observed so profound a silence that she could not obtain a word in answer to all the questions she put, in order to find the reason of so extraordinary an alteration. After supper she asked him again why he was so melancholy, but could get no information, and he determined to go to bed rather than give her the least satisfaction. Without examining how he passed the night, his mind full, as it was, with the charms of the princess, I shall only observe that as he sat next day on the sofa opposite his mother, as she was spinning cotton, he spoke to her in these words. I perceive, mother, that my silence yesterday has much troubled you. I was not, nor am I, sick, as I fancy you believed. But I assure you that what I felt then, and now endure, is worse than any disease. I cannot explain what ails me, but doubt not what I am going to relate will inform you. It was not proclaimed in this quarter of the town, and therefore you could know nothing of it, that the sultan's daughter was yesterday to go to the baths. I heard this as I walked about the town, and an order was issued that all the shops should be shut up in her way thither, and everybody keep within doors, to leave the streets free for her and her attendants. As I was not then far from the bath, I had a great curiosity to see the princess's face, and as it occurred to me that the princess, when she came nigh the door of the bath, would pull her veil off, I resolved to conceal myself behind the door. You know the situation of the door, and may imagine that I must have had a full view of her. The princess threw off her veil, and I had the happiness of seeing her lovely face with the greatest security. This mother was the cause of my melancholy and silence yesterday. I love the princess with more violence than I can express and as my passion increases every moment, I cannot live without the possession of the amiable Budir al Budur, and am resolved to ask her in marriage of the sultan her father. 
Allah ad Deen's mother listened with surprise to what her son told her. But when he talked of asking the princess in marriage, she could not help bursting out into a loud laugh. Allah ad Deen would have gone on with his rhapsody, but she interrupted him. Alas, child, said she, what are you thinking of? You must be mad to talk thus. I assure you, mother, replied Allah ad Deen, that I am not mad, but in my right senses. I foresaw that you would reproach me with folly and extravagance. But I must tell you once more that I am resolved to demand the princess of the sultan in marriage, and your remonstrances shall not prevent me. Indeed, son, replied the mother seriously, I cannot help telling you that you have forgotten yourself and if you would put this resolution of yours in execution, I do not see whom you can prevail upon to venture to make the proposal for you. You yourself, replied he immediately. I go to the sultan, answered the mother, amazed and surprised. I shall be cautious how I engage in such an errand. Why, who are you, son? continued she that you can have the assurance to think of your sultan's daughter. Have you forgotten that your father was one of the poorest tailors in the capital, and that I am of no better extraction? And do not you know that sultans never marry their daughters but to princes, sons of sovereigns like themselves? Mother, answered Allah ad Deen, I have already told you that I foresaw all that you have said or can say, and tell you again that neither your discourse nor your remonstrances shall make me change my mind. I have told you that you must ask the princess in marriage for me. It is a favour I desire of you, and I beg of you not to refuse, unless you would rather see me in my grave than by your compliance give me new life." The good old woman was much embarrassed when she found Allah ad Deen obstinately persisting in so wild a design. My son, said she again, I am your mother who brought you into the world, and there is nothing that is reasonable but I would readily do for you. If I were to go and treat about your marriage with some neighbour's daughter, whose circumstances were equal with yours, I would do it with all my heart and even then they would expect you should have some little estate or fortune, or be of some trade. When such poor folks as we are wish to marry, the first thing they ought to think of is how to live. But without reflecting on the meanness of your birth, and the little merit and fortune you have to recommend you, you aim at the highest pitch of exultation and your pretensions are no less than to demand in marriage the daughter of your sovereign, who with one single word can crush you to pieces. I say nothing of what respects yourself. I leave you to reflect on what you have to do, if you have ever so little thought. I come now to consider what concerns myself. How could so extraordinary a thought come into your head, as that I should go to the sultan, and make a proposal to him to give his daughter in marriage to you. Suppose I had, not to say the boldness, but the impudence, to present myself before the sultan, and make so extravagant a request, to whom should I address myself to be introduced to his majesty? Do you not think the first person I should speak to would take me for a madwoman, and chastise me as I should deserve? Suppose, however, that there is no difficulty in presenting myself for an audience of the sultan, and I know there is none to those who go to petition for justice, which he distributes equally among his subjects. I know, too, that to those who ask a favour, he grants it with pleasure when he sees it is deserved, and the persons are worthy of it. But is that your case? Do you think you have merited the honour you would have me ask for you? Are you worthy of it? What have you done to claim such a favour, either for your prince or country? How have you distinguished yourself? If you have done nothing to merit so high a distinction, nor are worthy of it, with what face shall I ask it? 
how can I open my mouth to make the proposal to the sultan? His majestic presence and the lustre of his court would absolutely confound me, who used even to tremble before my dear husband, your father, when I asked him for anything. There is another reason, my son, which you do not think of, which is that nobody ever goes to ask a favour of the sultan without a present. But what presents have you to make? And if you had any that were worthy of the least attention of so great a monarch, what proportion could they bear to the favour you would ask? Therefore, reflect well on what you are about, and consider that you aspire to an object which it is impossible for you to obtain. Allah ad -Din heard very calmly all that his mother could say to dissuade him from his design and after he had weighed her representations in all points, replied, My own mother, it is great rashness in me to presume to carry my pretensions so far, and a great want of consideration to ask you, with so much heat and precipitancy, to go and make the proposal to the sultan without first taking proper measures to procure a favourable reception, and therefore beg your pardon. But be not surprised that through the violence of my passion I did not at first see every measure necessary to procure me the happiness I seek. I love the princess, or rather I adore her, and shall always persevere in my design of marrying her. I am obliged to you for the hint you have given me, and look upon it as the first step I ought to take to procure the happy issue I promise myself." You say it is not customary to go to the sultan without a present, and that I have nothing worthy of his acceptance. As to the necessity of a present, I agree with you, and own that I never thought of it. But as to what you say that I have nothing fit to offer, do not you think, mother, that what I brought home with me, the day on which I was delivered from an inevitable death, may be an acceptable present? I mean what you and I both took for coloured glass. But now I am undeceived, and can tell you that they are jewels of inestimable value, and fit for the greatest monarchs. I know the worth of them by frequenting the shops, and you may take my word that all the precious stones which I saw in the most capital jeweller's possessions were not to be compared to those we have, either for size or beauty and yet they value theirs at an excessive price. In short, neither you nor I know the value of ours. But be it as it may, by the little experience I have, I am persuaded that they will be received very favourably by the Sultan. You have a large porcelain dish fit to hold them. Fetch it, and let us see how they will look, when we have arranged them according to their different colours. Allah ad mother brought the china dish, when he took the jewels out of the two purses in which he had kept them, and placed them in order according to his fancy. But the brightness and lustre they emitted in the daytime, and the variety of the colours, so dazzled the eyes both of mother and son, that they were astonished beyond measure, for they had only seen them by the light of the lamp, and though the latter had beheld them pendant on the trees like fruit beautiful to the eye, Yet, as he was then but a boy, he looked on them only as glittering playthings. After they had admired the beauty of the jewels some time, Allah ad -Din said to his mother, Now you cannot excuse yourself from going to the sultan, under pretext of not having a present to make him, since here is one which will gain you a favourable reception. Though the good widow, notwithstanding the beauty and lustre of the precious stones, did not believe them so valuable as her son estimated them, she thought such a present might nevertheless be agreeable to the sultan, but still she hesitated at the request. "'My son,' said she, "'I cannot conceive that your present will have its desired effect, or that the sultan will look upon me with a favourable eye. I am sure that if I attempt to deliver your strange message, I shall have no power to open my mouth. Therefore, I shall not only lose my labour, but the present, which you say is so invaluable, and shall return home again in confusion, to tell you that your hopes are frustrated. 
I have represented the consequence, and you ought to believe me. But, added she, I will exert my best endeavour to please you, and wish I may have power to ask the sultan, as you would have me. But certainly he will either laugh at me, send me back like a fool, or be in so great a rage as to make us both the victims of his fury. She used many other arguments to endeavour to make him change his mind, but the charms of the princess had made too great an impression on his heart for him to be dissuaded from his design. He persisted in importuning his mother to execute his resolution, and she, as much out of tenderness as for fear he should be guilty of greater extravagance, complied with his request. End of section 17 Section 18 of The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Section 18 The Story of Allah ad Din, or The Wonderful Lamp, Part 3. As it was now late, and the time for admission to the palace was past, it was put off till the next day. The mother and son talked of different matters the remaining part of the day, and Allah ad Deen strove to encourage her in the task she had undertaken, while she, notwithstanding all his arguments, could not persuade herself she should succeed, and it must be confessed she had reason enough to doubt. Child, said she to Allah ad Deen, if the sultan should receive me as favourably as I wish for your sake, should even hear my proposal with calmness, and, after this scarcely to be expected reception, should think of asking me where lie your riches and your estate, for he will sooner inquire after these than your person. If, I say, he should ask me these questions, what answer would you have me return him? Let us not be uneasy, mother, replied Allah ad Deen, about what may never happen. First, let us see how the sultan receives, and what answer he gives you. If it should so fall out, that he desires to be informed of what you mention, I have thought of an answer, and am confident that the lamp which hath supported us so long will not fail me in time of need. The tailor's widow could not say anything against what her son then proposed, but reflected that the lamp might be capable of doing greater wonders than just providing victuals for them. This consideration satisfied her, and at the same time removed all the difficulties which might have prevented her from undertaking the service she had promised her son with the sultan. Allah ad Deen, who penetrated into his mother's thoughts, said to her, Above all things, mother, be sure to keep secret our possession of the lamp, for thereupon depends the success we have to expect. And after this caution, Allah ad Deen and his mother parted to go to rest. But violent love, and the great prospect of so immense a fortune, had so much possessed the son's thoughts, that he could not repose himself so well as he could have wished. He rose before daybreak, awakened his mother, pressing her to get herself dressed to go to the sultan's palace, and to get admittance, if possible, before the grand vizier, the other viziers, and the great officers of state, went in to take their seats in the divan, where the sultan always assisted in person. Allah ad Deen's mother took the china dish in which they had put the jewels the day before, wrapped in two napkins, one finer than the other which was tied at the four corners for more easy carriage, and set forward for the sultan's palace. When she came to the gates, the grand vizier, the other viziers, and most distinguished lords of the court were just gone in. But notwithstanding, the crowd of people who had business was great. She got into the divan, a spacious hall, the entrance into which was very magnificent. She placed herself just before the sultan, Grand Vizier, and the great lords, who sat in council on his right and left hand. Several causes were called, according to their order, 
pleaded and adjudged, until the time the divan generally broke up, when the sultan rising returned to his apartment, attended by the grand vizier. The other viziers and ministers of state then retired, as also did those whose business had called them thither, some pleased with gaining their causes, others dissatisfied at the sentences pronounced against them, and some in expectation of theirs being heard the next sitting. Alla ad Deen's mother, seeing the sultan retire, and all the people depart, judged rightly that he would not sit again that day, and resolved to go home. When Alla ad Deen saw her return with the present designed for the sultan, he knew not what to think of her success, and in his fear lest she should bring him some ill news, had not courage to ask her any questions. But she, who had never set foot in the sultan's palace before, and knew not what was every day practised there, freed him from his embarrassment, and said to him, with a great deal of simplicity, "'Son, I have seen the sultan, and am very well persuaded he has seen me too, for I placed myself just before him. But he was so much taken up with those who attended on all sides of him, that I pitied him, and wondered at his patience. At last, I believe he was heartily tired, for he rose up suddenly, and would not hear a great many who were ready prepared to speak to him, but went away, at which I was well pleased, for indeed I began to lose all patience, and was extremely fatigued with staying so long. But there is no harm done. I will go again to-morrow. Perhaps the sultan may not be so busy. Though his passion was very violent, Alla ad Deen was forced to be satisfied with this delay and to fortify himself with patience. He had at least the satisfaction to find that his mother had got over the greatest difficulty, which was to procure access to the sultan, and hoped that the example of those she saw speak to him would embolden her to acquit herself better of her commission when a favourable opportunity might offer to speak to him. The next morning she repaired to the sultan's palace with the present, as early as the day before. But when she came there, she found the gates of the divan shut, and understood that the council sat but every other day, therefore she must come again the next. This news she carried to her son, whose only relief was to guard himself with patience. She went six times afterwards on the days appointed, placed herself always directly before the sultan, but with as little success as the first morning, and might have perhaps come a thousand times to as little purpose, if, luckily, the sultan himself had not taken particular notice of her, for only those who came with petitions approached the sultan, when each pleaded their cause in its turn, and Alla ad Deen's mother was not one of them. On the sixth day, however, after the divan was broken up, when the sultan returned to his own apartment, he said to his grand vizier, I have for some time observed a certain woman, who attends constantly every day that I give audience, with something wrapped up in a napkin. She always stands up from the beginning to the breaking up of the audience, and affects to place herself just before me. Do you know what she wants? Sir, replied the grand vizier, who knew no more than the sultan what she wanted but did not wish to seem uninformed. Your Majesty knows that women often make complaints on trifles. Perhaps she may come to complain to Your Majesty that somebody has sold her some bad flower, or some such trifling matter. The Sultan was not satisfied with this answer, but replied, If this woman comes to our next audience, do not fail to call her, that I may hear what she has to say. The Grand Vizier made answer by lowering his hand, and then lifting it up above his head, signifying his willingness to lose it if he failed. By this time the tailor's widow was so much used to go to audience and stand before the Sultan, that she did not think it any trouble, if she could but satisfy her son that she neglected nothing that lay in her power to please him. The next audience day she went to the divan placed herself in front of the sultan as usual, 
and before the Grand Vizier had made his report of business, the Sultan perceived her, and compassionating her for having waited so long, said to the Vizier, Before you enter upon any business, remember the woman I spoke to you about. Bid her come near, and let us hear and dispatch her business first. The Grand Vizier immediately called the Chief of the Mace-Bearers, who stood ready to obey his commands, and pointing to her, bade him go to that woman, and tell her to come before the Sultan. The chief of the officers went to Alla ad -Din's mother, and at a sign he gave her, she followed him to the foot of the Sultan's throne, where he left her and retired to his place by the Grand Vizier. The old woman, after the example of others whom she saw salute the Sultan, bowed her head down to the carpet, which covered the platform of the throne, and remained in that posture till the Sultan bade her rise, which she had no sooner done than he said to her, Good woman, I have observed you to stand a long time, from the beginning to the rising of the divan. What business brings you here? After these words, Alla ad -Din's mother prostrated herself a second time, and when she arose, said, Monarch of monarchs, before I tell your majesty the extraordinary and almost incredible business which brings me before your high throne, I beg of you to pardon the boldness, or rather impudence, of the demand I am going to make, which is so uncommon that I tremble, and am ashamed to propose it to my sovereign. In order to give her the more freedom to explain herself, the sultan ordered all to quit the divan but the grand vizier, and then told her she might speak without restraint. Allah ad -Din's mother, not content with this favour of the sultan's, to save her the trouble and confusion of speaking before so many people, was notwithstanding for securing herself against his anger, which, from the proposal she was going to make, she was not a little apprehensive of. Therefore, resuming her discourse, she said, I beg of your majesty, if you should think my demand the least injurious or offensive, to assure me first of your pardon and forgiveness. Well, replied the sultan, I will forgive you, be it what it may, and no hurt shall come to you. Speak boldly. When Alla ad -Din's mother had taken all these precautions, for fear of the sultan's anger, she told him faithfully how Alla ad -Din had seen the princess Budir al Badur the violent love that fatal sight had inspired him with, the declaration he had made to her of it when he came home, and what representations she had made to dissuade him from a passion no less disrespectful, said she, to your majesty as sultan, than to the princess your daughter. But, continued she, my son, instead of taking my advice and reflecting on his presumption, was so obstinate as to persevere, and to threaten me with some desperate act if I refused to come and ask the princess in marriage of your majesty. And it was not without the greatest reluctance that I was led to accede to his request, for which I beg your majesty once more to pardon not only me, but also Allah ad -Din, my son, for entertaining so rash a project as to aspire to so high an alliance. The sultan hearkened to this discourse with mildness, and without showing the least anger. But before he gave her any answer, asked her what she had brought tied up in the napkin. She took the china dish, which she had set down at the foot of the throne, before she prostrated herself before him, untied it, and presented it to the sultan. The sultan's amazement and surprise were inexpressible when he saw so many large, beautiful, and valuable jewels collected in the dish. He remained for some time motionless with admiration. At last, when he had recovered himself, he received the present from Allah ad -Din's mother's hand, crying out in a transport of joy, How rich! How beautiful! After he had admired and handled all the jewels, one after another, he turned to his grand vizier, and showing him the dish, said, Behold, admire, wonder, and confess 
that your eyes never beheld jewels so rich and beautiful before. The vizier was charmed. Well, continued the sultan, what sayest thou to such a present? Is it not worthy of the princess my daughter? And ought I not to bestow her on one who values her at so great price? These words put the grand vizier into extreme agitation. The sultan had some time before signified to him his intention of bestowing the princess on a son of his. Therefore he was afraid, and not without grounds, that the sultan, dazzled by so rich and extraordinary a present, might change his mind. Therefore, going to him, and whispering him in the ear, he said, I cannot but own that the present is worthy of the princess, but I beg of your majesty to grant me three months before you come to a final resolution. I hope before that time my son, on whom you have had the goodness to look with a favourable eye, will be able to make a nobler present than Allah ad -Din, who is an entire stranger to your majesty. The sultan, though he was fully persuaded that it was not possible for the vizier to provide so considerable a present for his son to make the princess, yet, as he had given him hopes, hearkened to him and granted his request. Turning therefore to the old widow, he said to her, Good woman, go home and tell your son that I agree to the proposal you have made me, but I cannot marry the princess my daughter till the paraphernalia I design for her be got ready, which cannot be finished these three months, but at the expiration of that time come again. Alla ad mother returned home much more gratified than she had expected, since she had met with a favourable answer, instead of the refusal and confusion she had dreaded. For two circumstances, Alla ad when he saw his mother returning, judged that she brought him good news. The one was that she returned sooner than ordinary, and the other the gaiety of her countenance. Well, mother, said he, may I entertain any hopes, or must I die with despair? When she had pulled off her veil, and had seated herself on the sofa by him, she said to him, Not to keep you long in suspense, son, I will begin by telling you, that instead of thinking of dying, you have every reason to be well satisfied. Then, pursuing her discourse, she told him that she had an audience before everybody else, which made her come home so soon. The precautions she had taken, lest she should have displeased the sultan, by making the proposal of marriage between him and the princess Budir al Badur, and the condescending answer she had received from the sultan's own mouth and that as far as she could judge, the present had wrought a powerful effect. But when I least expected it, said she, and he was going to give me an answer, and I fancied a favourable one, the Grand Vizier whispered him in the ear, and I was afraid might be some obstacle to his good intentions towards us. And so it happened, for the Sultan desired me to come to audience again this day three months. Alla ad -Din thought himself the most happy of all men at hearing this news, and thanked his mother for the pains she had taken in the affair, the good success of which was of so great importance to his peace. Though from his impatience to obtain the object of his passion, three months seemed an age, yet he disposed himself to wait with patience, relying on the sultan's word, which he looked upon to be irrevocable. But all that time, he not only counted the hours, days, and weeks, but every moment. When two of the three months were passed, his mother one evening going to light the lamp, and finding no oil in the house, went out to buy some, and when she came into the city, found a general rejoicing. The shops, instead of being shut up, were open, dressed with foliage, silks, and carpeting, every one striving to show their zeal in the most distinguished manner, according to his ability. The streets were crowded with officers in habits of ceremony, mounted on horses richly caparisoned, each attended by a great many footmen. Alla ad mother asked the oil merchant 
what was the meaning of all this preparation of public festivity whence came you good woman said he that you don't know that the grand vizier's son is to marry the princess budir al badur the sultan's daughter to-night she will presently return from the baths and these officers whom you see are to assist at the cavalcade to the palace where the ceremony is to be solemnized this was news enough for alla ad deen's mother she ran till she was quite out of breath home to her son who little suspected any such event child cried she you are undone you depend upon the sultan's fine promises but they will come to nothing alla ad deen was alarmed at these words mother replied he how do you know the sultan has been guilty of a breach of promise this night answered the mother the grand vizier's son is to marry the princess budir al badur she then related how she had heard it so that from all circumstances he had no reason to doubt the truth of what she said at this account alla ad deen was thunderstruck any other man would have sunk under the shock but a sudden hope of disappointing his rival soon roused his spirits and he bethought himself of the lamp which had on every emergence been so useful to him and without venting his rage in empty words against the sultan the vizier or his son he only said perhaps mother the vizier's son may not be so happy to-night as he promises himself while i go into my chamber a moment do you get supper ready she accordingly went about it but guessed that her son was going to make use of the lamp to prevent if possible the consummation of the marriage when alla ad deen had got into his chamber he took the lamp rubbed it in the same place as before when immediately the genie appeared and said to him what wouldst thou have i am ready to obey thee as thy slave and the slave of all those who have that lamp in their possession i and the other slaves of the lamp hear me said alla ad deen thou hast hitherto brought me whatever i wanted as to provisions but now i have business of the greatest importance for thee to execute i have demanded the princess badir al badur in marriage of the sultan her father he promised her to me only requiring three months delay but instead of keeping that promise has this night married her to the grand vizier's son what i ask of you is that as soon as the bride and bridegroom are retired you bring them both hither in their bed master replied the genie i will obey you have you any other commands none at present answered alla ad deen the genie then disappeared alla ad deen having left his chamber supped with his mother with the same tranquillity of mind as usual and after supper talked of the princess's marriage as of an affair wherein he had not the least concern he then retired to his own chamber again and left his mother to go to bed but sat up waiting the execution of his orders to the genie in the meantime everything was prepared with the greatest magnificence in the sultan's palace to celebrate the princess's nuptials and the evening was spent with all the usual ceremonies and great rejoicings till midnight when the grand vizier's son on a signal given him by the chief of the princess's eunuchs slipped away from the company and was introduced by that officer into the princess's apartment where the nuptial bed was prepared he went to bed first and in a little time after the sultaness accompanied by her own women and those of the princess brought the bride who according to the custom of new married ladies made great resistance the sultaness herself helped to undress her put her into bed by a kind of violence and after having kissed her and wished her good night retired with the women to her own apartments no sooner was the door shut than the genie as the faithful slave of the lamp and punctual in executing the command of those who possessed it without giving the bridegroom the least time to caress his bride to the great amazement of them both took up the bed and transported it in an instant into alla ad deen's chamber where he set it down alla ad deen who had waited impatiently for this moment did not suffer the vizier's son to remain long in bed with the princess 
take this new married man said he to the genie shut him up in the outhouse and come again to-morrow morning before daybreak the genie instantly forced the vizier's son out of bed carried him whither alla ad deen had commanded him and after he had breathed upon him which prevented him stirring left him there passionate as was alla ad deen's love for the princess he did not talk much to her when they were alone but only said with a respectful air fear nothing adorable princess you are here in safety for notwithstanding the violence of my passion which your charms have kindled it shall never exceed the bounds of the profound adoration i owe you if i have been forced to come to this extremity it is not with any intention of affronting you but to prevent an unjust rival's possessing you contrary to the sultan your father's promise in favour of myself the princess who knew nothing of these particulars gave very little attention to what alla ad deen could say the fright and amazement of so surprising and unexpected an adventure had alarmed her so much that he could not get one word from her however he undressed himself took the bridegroom's place but lay with his back to the princess putting a sabre between himself and her to show that he deserved to be put to death if he attempted anything against her honour alla ad deen satisfied with having thus deprived his rival of the happiness he had flattered himself with slept very soundly though the princess Badir al Badur never passed a night so ill in her life and if we consider the condition in which the genie left the grand vizier's son we may imagine that the new bridegroom spent it much worse alla ad deen had no occasion the next morning to rub the lamp to call the genie who appeared at the hour appointed just when he had done dressing himself and said to him i am here master what are your commands go said alla ad deen fetch the vizier's son out of the place where you left him put him into his bed again and carry it to the sultan's palace from whence you brought it the genie presently returned with the vizier's son alla ad deen took up his sabre the bridegroom was laid by the princess and in an instant the nuptial bed was transported into the same chamber of the palace from whence it had been brought but we must observe that all this time the genie never was visible either to the princess or the grand vizier's son his hideous form would have made them die with fear neither did they hear anything of the discourse between alla ad deen and him they only perceived the motion of the bed and their transportation from one place to another which we may well imagine was enough to alarm them as soon as the genie had set down the nuptial bed in its proper place the sultan tapped at the door to wish her good morning the grand vizier's son who was almost perished with cold by standing in his thin undergarment all night and had not had time to warm himself in bed no sooner heard the knocking at the door than he got out of bed and ran into the robing chamber where he had undressed himself the night before the sultan having opened the door went to the bedside kissed the princess between the eyes according to custom wished her a good morrow but was extremely surprised to see her so melancholy she only cast at him a sorrowful look expressive of great affliction or great dissatisfaction he said a few words to her but finding that he could not get a word from her attributed it to her modesty and retired nevertheless he suspected that there was something extraordinary in this silence and thereupon went immediately to the sultaness's apartment told her in what a state he had found the princess and how she had received him sir said the sultaness your majesty ought not to be surprised at this behaviour new married people have naturally a reserve about them two or three days hence she will receive the sultan her father as she ought but i will go and see her added she i am much deceived if she receives me in the same manner as soon as the sultaness was dressed she went to the princess's apartment who was still in bed she undrew the curtain wished her good morrow and kissed her but how great was her surprise when she returned no answer and looking more attentively at her 
she perceived her to be much dejected, which made her judge that something had happened which she did not understand. "'How comes it, child?' said the sultaness, "'that you do not return my caresses. Ought you to treat your mother after this manner? I am induced to believe something extraordinary has happened. Come, tell me freely, and leave me no longer in a painful suspense.' At last the princess broke silence with a deep sigh, and said, "'Alas, most honoured mother, forgive me if I have failed in the respect I owe you. My mind is so full of the extraordinary circumstances which have befallen me this night, that I have not yet recovered my amazement and alarm.' She then told her how the instant after she and her husband were together, the bed was transported into a dark, dirty room, where he was taken from her and carried away, but where she knew not, and that she was left alone with a young man, who, after he had said something to her, which her fright did not suffer her to hear, laid himself in her husband's place, but first put his sabre between them, and in the morning her husband was brought to her again, when the bed was transported back to her own chamber in an instant. "'All this,' said she, was but just done when the sultan my father came into my chamber. I was so overwhelmed with grief that I had not power to speak, and am afraid that he is offended at the manner in which I received the honour he did me. But I hope he will forgive me when he knows my melancholy adventure and the miserable state I am in at present. The sultaness heard all the princess told her very patiently, but would not believe it. "'You did well, child,' said she, "'not to speak of this to your father. Take care not to mention it to anybody, for you will certainly be thought mad if you talk in this manner.' "'Madam,' replied the princess, "'I can assure you I am in my right senses. Ask my husband, and he will tell you the same circumstances.' "'I will,' said the sultaness. But if he should talk in the same manner, I shall not be better persuaded of the truth. Come, rise, and throw off this idle fancy. It will be a strange event if all the feasts and rejoicings in the kingdom should be interrupted by such a vision. Do you not hear the trumpets of congratulation and concerts of the finest music? Cannot these inspire you with joy and pleasure? and make you forget the fancies of an imagination disturbed by what can have been only a dream. At the same time, the sultaness called the princess's women, and after she had seen her get up and begin dressing, went to the sultan's apartment, told him that her daughter had got some odd notions in her head, but that there was nothing in them but idle fantasy. She then sent for the vizier's son, to know of him something of what the princess had told her. But he, thinking himself highly honoured to be allied to the sultan, and not willing to lose the princess, denied what had happened. "'That is enough,' answered the sultaness. "'I ask no more. I see you are wiser than my daughter.' The rejoicings lasted all that day in the palace, and the sultaness, who never left the princess, forgot nothing to divert her, and induce her to take part in the various diversions and shows. But she was so struck with the idea of what had happened to her in the night, that it was easy to see her thoughts were entirely taken up with it. Neither was the Grand Vizier's son in less tribulation, though his ambition made him disguise his feelings so well that nobody doubted of his being a happy bridegroom. Allah ad -Din, who was well acquainted with what passed in the palace, was sure the new married couple were to sleep together again, notwithstanding the troublesome adventure of the night before, and therefore, having as great an inclination to disturb them, had recourse to his lamp, and when the genie appeared and offered his service, he said to him, The Grand Vizier's son and the Princess Badir al Badur are to sleep together again to-night. Go, and as soon as they are in bed, bring the bed hither, as thou didst yesterday. The genie obeyed as faithfully and exactly as the day before. The Grand Vizier's son passed the night as coldly and disagreeably, 
and the princess had the mortification again to have Alla ad Deen for her bedfellow, with the sabre between them. The genie, according to orders, came the next morning, brought the bridegroom, laid him by his bride, and then carried the bed and new-married couple back again to the palace. The sultan, after the reception the princess had given him, was very anxious to know how she had passed the second night, and therefore went into her chamber as early as the morning before. The grand vizier's son, more ashamed and mortified with the ill success of this last night, no sooner heard him coming than he jumped out of bed and ran hastily into the robing chamber. The sultan went to the princess's bedside, and after the same caresses he had given her the former morning, bade her good morrow. "'Well, daughter,' said he, "'are you in a better humour than yesterday?' Still the princess was silent, and the sultan, perceiving her to be more troubled and in greater confusion than before, doubted not that something very extraordinary was the cause, but provoked that his daughter should conceal it, he said to her in a rage, with his sabre in his hand, "'Daughter, tell me what is the matter, or I will cut off your head immediately.' The princess, more frightened at the menaces and tone of the enraged sultan than at the sight of the drawn sabre, at last broke silence, and said, with tears in her eyes, "'My dear father and sultan, I ask your majesty's pardon if I have offended you, and hope that out of your goodness and clemency you will have compassion on me, when I shall have told you in what a miserable condition I have spent this last night as well as the preceding.' After this preamble, which appeased and affected the sultan, she told him what had happened to her in so moving a manner that he, who loved her tenderly, was most sensibly grieved. She added, If your majesty doubts the truth of this account, you may inform yourself from my husband, who, I am persuaded, will tell you the same thing. The sultan immediately felt all the extreme uneasiness so surprising an adventure must have given the princess. Daughter, said he, you are much to blame for not telling me this yesterday, since it concerns me as much as yourself. I did not marry you with an intention to make you miserable, but that you might enjoy all the happiness you deserve, and might hope for from a husband who to me seemed agreeable to you. If face all these troublesome ideas from your memory, I will take care that you shall have no more disagreeable and insupportable nights." As soon as the sultan had returned to his own apartment, he sent for the grand vizier. Vizier, said he, have you seen your son, and has he told you anything? The vizier replied, no. The sultan related all the circumstances of which the princess had informed him, and afterwards said, I do not doubt but that my daughter has told me the truth, but nevertheless I should be glad to have it confirmed by your son. Therefore, Go and ask him how it was. End of section 18section 19 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Section 19 The Story of Allah ad Deen, or The Wonderful Lamp, Part 4. The Grand Vizier went immediately to his son, communicated what the Sultan had told him, and enjoined him to conceal nothing, but to relate the whole truth. "'I will disguise nothing from you, father,' replied the son, "'for, indeed, all that the Princess has stated is true. But what relates particularly to myself she knows nothing of. Since my marriage I have passed two nights,' beyond imagination or expression disagreeable, not to mention the fright I was in, at finding my bed lifted four times, transported from one place to another, without being able to guess how it was done. You may judge of the miserable condition I was in, passing two whole nights in nothing but my undervestments, standing in a kind of closet, unable to stir out of the place, or to make the least movement, though I could not perceive any obstacle to prevent me. Yet I must tell you that all this ill usage does not in the least lessen those sentiments of love 
respect and gratitude i entertain for the princess and of which she is so deserving but i must confess that notwithstanding all the honour and splendour that attends marrying my sovereign's daughter i would much rather die than continue in so exalted an alliance if i must undergo nightly much longer what i have already endured i do not doubt but that the princess entertains the same sentiments and that she will readily agree to a separation which is so necessary both for her repose and mine therefore father i beg by the same tenderness which led you to procure me so great an honour to obtain the sultan's consent that our marriage may be declared null and void notwithstanding the grand vizier's ambition to have his son allied to the sultan the firm resolution he saw he had formed to be separated from the princess made him not think it proper to propose to him to have patience for a few days to see if this disappointment would not have an end but he left him to give an account of what he had related to him and without waiting till the sultan himself whom he found disposed to it spoke of setting aside the marriage he begged of him to give his son leave to retire from the palace alleging it was not just that the princess should be a moment longer exposed to so terrible a persecution upon his son's account the grand vizier found no difficulty to obtain what he asked as the sultan had determined already orders were given to put a stop to all rejoicings in the palace and town and expresses dispatched to all parts of his dominions to countermand them and in a short time all rejoicings ceased this sudden and unexpected change gave rise both in the city and kingdom to various speculations and inquiries but no other account could be given of it except that both the vizier and his son went out of the palace very much dejected nobody but allah ad din knew the secret he rejoiced within himself at the happy success procured by his lamp which now he had no more occasion to rub to produce the genie to prevent the consummation of the marriage as he had certain information it was broken off and that his rival had left the palace neither the sultan nor the grand vizier who had forgotten allah ad din and his request had the least thought that he had any concern in the enchantment which caused the dissolution of the marriage allah ad din waited till the three months were completed which the sultan had appointed for the consummation of the marriage between the princess Badir al badur and himself and the next day sent his mother to the palace to remind the sultan of his promise Allah ad din's mother went to the palace and stood in the same place as before in the hall of audience the sultan no sooner cast his eyes upon her than he knew her again remembered her business and how long he had put her off therefore when the grand vizier was beginning to make his report the sultan interrupted him and said vizier i see the good woman who made me the present of jewels some months ago forbear your report till i have heard what she has to say the vizier looking about the divan perceived the tailor's widow and sent the chief of the mace-bearers to conduct her to the sultan allah ad din's mother came to the foot of the throne prostrated herself as usual and when she arose the sultan asked her what she would have sir said she i come to represent to your majesty in the name of my son allah ad din that the three months at the end of which you ordered me to come again are expired and to beg you to remember your promise the sultan when he had fixed a time to answer the request of this good woman little thought of hearing any more of a marriage which he imagined must be very disagreeable to the princess when he considered the meanness and poverty of her dress and appearance but this summons for him to fulfil his promise was somewhat embarrassing he declined giving an answer till he had consulted his vizier and signified to trim the little inclination he had to conclude a match for his daughter with a stranger whose rank he supposed to be very mean the grand vizier freely told the sultan his thoughts and said to him in my opinion sir there is an infallible way for your majesty to avoid a match so disproportionable without giving allah ad din were he known to your majesty 
any cause of complaint, which is to set so high a price upon the princess that, however rich he may be, he cannot comply with. This is the only evasion to make him desist from so bold, not to say rash, an undertaking, which he never weighed before he engaged in it. The sultan, approving of the grand vizier's advice, turned to the tailor's widow, and said to her, "'Good woman, it is true sultans ought to abide by their word, and I am ready to keep mine, by making your son happy in marriage with the princess my daughter. But, as I cannot marry her without some further valuable consideration from your son, you may tell him I will fulfil my promise as soon as he shall send me forty trays of massive gold, full of the same sort of jewels you have already made me a present of, and carried by the like number of black slaves, who shall be led by as many young and handsome white slaves, all dressed magnificently. On these conditions I am ready to bestow the princess my daughter upon him. Therefore, good woman, go and tell him so, and I will wait till you bring me his answer. Allah ad Din's mother prostrated herself a second time before the sultan's throne, and retired. In her way home she laughed within herself at her son's foolish imagination. Where, says she, can he get so many large gold trays, and such precious stones to fill them? Must he go again to that subterraneous abode, the entrance into which is stopped up, and gather them off the trees? But where will he get so many such slaves as the sultan requires? <laughs> it is altogether out of his power, and I believe he will not be much pleased with my embassy this time. When she came home, full of these thoughts, she said to her son, Indeed, child, I would not have you think any farther of your marriage with the princess. The sultan received me very kindly, and I believe he was well inclined to you. But if I am not much deceived, the grand vizier has made him change his mind, as you will guess from what I have to tell you. After I had represented to his majesty that the three months were expired, and begged of him to remember his promise, I observed that he whispered with his grand vizier before he gave me his answer. She then gave her son an exact account of what the sultan had said to her, and the conditions on which he consented to the match. Afterwards she said to him, The sultan expects your answer immediately. But, continued she laughing, I believe he may wait long enough. Not so long, mother, as you imagine replied Alla ad -Din. The sultan is mistaken if he thinks by this exorbitant demand to prevent my entertaining thoughts of the princess. I expected greater difficulties, and that he would have set a higher price upon her incomparable charms. I am very well pleased. His demand is but a trifle to what I could have done for her. But while I think of satisfying his request, go and get something for our dinner, and leave the rest to me. As soon as his mother was gone out to market, Alla ad Din took the lamp, and rubbing it, the genie appeared, and offered his service as usual. The sultan, said Alla ad Din to him, gives me the princess his daughter in marriage, but demands first forty large trays of massive gold, full of the fruits of the garden from whence I took this lamp, and these he expects to have carried by as many black slaves, each preceded by a young handsome white slave richly clothed. Go and fetch me this present as soon as possible, that I may send it to him before the divan breaks up. The genie told him his command should be immediately obeyed, and disappeared. In a little time afterwards, the genie returned with forty black slaves, each bearing on his head a heavy tray of pure gold, full of pearls, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and every sort of precious stones, all larger and more beautiful than those presented to the sultan. Each tray was covered with silver tissue, embroidered with flowers of gold. These, together with the white slaves, quite filled the house, which was but a small one, the little court before it, and a small garden behind. 
the genie asked if he had any other commands and Allah ad deen telling him that he wanted nothing farther he disappeared when Allah ad deen's mother came from market she was much surprised to see so many people and such vast riches as soon as she had laid down her provisions she was going to pull off her veil but he prevented her and said mother let us lose no time before the sultan and the divan rise i would have you return to the palace with this present as the dowry demanded for the princess that he may judge by my diligence and exactness of the ardent and sincere desire i have to procure myself the honour of this alliance without waiting for his mother's reply Allah ad deen opened the street door and made the slaves walk out each white slave followed by a black with a tray upon his head when they were all out the mother followed the last black slave he shut the door and then retired to his chamber full of hopes that the sultan after this present which was such as he required would receive him as his son-in-law the first white slave who went out bade all the people who were going by stop and before they were all clear of the house the streets were crowded with spectators who ran to see so extraordinary and magnificent a procession the dress of each slave was so rich both for the stuff and the jewels that those who were dealers in them valued each at no less than a million of money besides the neatness and propriety of the dress the noble air fine shape and proportion of each slave were unparalleled their grave walk at an equal distance from each other the lustre of the jewels curiously set in their girdles of gold in beautiful symmetry and the egrets of precious stones in their turbans which were of an unusual but elegant taste put the spectators into such great admiration that they could not avoid gazing at them and following them with their eyes as far as possible but the streets were so crowded with people that none could move out of the spot they stood on as they had to pass through several streets to the palace a great part of the city had an opportunity of seeing them as soon as the first of these slaves arrived at the palace gate the porters formed themselves into order taking him for a prince from the richness and magnificence of his habit and were going to kiss the hem of his garment but the slave who was instructed by the genie prevented them and said we are only slaves our master will appear at the proper time the first slave followed by the rest advanced into the second court which was very spacious and in which the sultan's household was ranged during the sitting of the divan the magnificence of the officers who stood at the head of their troops was considerably eclipsed by the slaves who bore allah ad deen's present of which they themselves made a part nothing was ever seen so beautiful and brilliant in the sultan's palace and all the lustre of the lords of his court was not to be compared to them as the sultan who had been informed of their march and approach to the palace had given orders for them to be admitted they met with no obstacle but went into the divan in regular order one part filing to the right and the other to the left after they were all entered and had formed a semicircle before the sultan's throne the black slaves laid the golden trays on the carpet prostrated themselves touching the carpet with their foreheads and at the same time the white slaves did the same when they rose the black slaves uncovered the trays and then all stood with their arms crossed over their breasts in the meantime Allah ad deen's mother advanced to the foot of the throne and having paid her respects said to the sultan sir my son is sensible this present which he has sent your majesty is much below the princess budir al badur's worth but hopes nevertheless that your majesty will accept of it and make it agreeable to the princess and with the greater confidence since he has endeavoured to conform to the conditions you were pleased to impose the sultan was not able to give the least attention to this compliment the moment he cast his eyes on the forty trays full of the most precious brilliant and beautiful jewels he had ever seen and the fourscore slaves who appeared by the elegance of their persons and the richness and magnificence of their dress like so many princes he was so struck that he could not recover from his admiration 
instead of answering the compliment of Allah ad Deen's mother, he addressed himself to the Grand Vizier, who could not any more than the Sultan comprehend from whence such a profusion of richness could come. "'Well, Vizier,' said he aloud, "'who do you think it can be that has sent me so extraordinary a present, and neither of us know? Do you think him worthy of the Princess Budir al Badur, my daughter?' The vizier, notwithstanding his envy and grief to see a stranger preferred to be the sultan's son-in-law before his son, durst not disguise his sentiments. It was too visible that Allah ad Deen's present was more than sufficient to merit his being received into royal alliance. Therefore, consulting his master's feelings, he returned this answer. I am so far from having any thoughts that the person who has made your majesty so noble a present is unworthy of the honour you would do him, that I should say he deserved much more, if I was not persuaded that the greatest treasure in the world ought not to be put in competition with the princess, your majesty's daughter. This speech was applauded by all the lords who were then in council. The sultan made no longer hesitation, nor thought of informing himself whether Allah ad Deen was endowed with all the qualifications requisite in one who aspired to be his son-in-law. The sight alone of such immense riches, and Allah ad Deen's quickness in satisfying his demand, without starting the least difficulty at the exorbitant conditions he had imposed, easily persuaded him that he could want nothing to render him accomplished, and such as he desired. Therefore, to send Allah ad Deen's mother back with all the satisfaction she could desire, he said to her, My good lady, go and tell your son that I wait with open arms to embrace him, and the more haste he makes to come and receive the princess my daughter from my hands, the greater pleasure he will do me. As soon as the tailor's widow had retired, overjoyed, as a woman in her condition must have been, to see her son raised beyond all expectations to such exalted fortune, the sultan put an end to the audience, and rising from his throne, ordered that the princess's eunuchs should come and carry the trays into their mistress's apartment, whether he went himself, to examine them with her at his leisure. The fourscore slaves were conducted into the palace, and the sultan, telling the princess of their magnificent appearance, ordered them to be brought before her apartment, that she might see through the lattices he had not exaggerated in his account of them. In the meantime, Allah ad Deen's mother got home, and showed in her air and countenance the good news she brought her son. "'My son,' said she to him, "'you have now all the reason in the world to be pleased. You are, contrary to my expectations,' arrived at the height of your desires not to keep you too long in suspense the sultan with the approbation of the whole court has declared that you are worthy to possess the princess badir al badur waits to embrace you and conclude your marriage therefore you must think of making some preparations for your interview which may answer the high opinion he has formed of your person and after the wonders I have seen you do, I am persuaded nothing can be wanting. But I must not forget to tell you the sultan waits for you with great impatience. Therefore, lose no time in paying your respects. Allah ad Deen, enraptured with this news, and full of the object which possessed his soul, made his mother very little reply, but retired to his chamber. There, after he had rubbed his lamp, which had never failed him in whatever he wished for. The obedient genie appeared. Genie, said Allah ad Deen, I want to bathe immediately, and you must afterwards provide me the richest and most magnificent habit ever worn by a monarch. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than the genie rendered him as well as himself invisible, and transported him into a hammam of the finest marble of all sorts of colours, where he was undressed, without seeing by whom, in a magnificent and spacious hall. From the hall he was led to the bath, which was of a moderate heat, 
and he was there rubbed and washed with various scented waters. After he had passed through several degrees of heat, he came out quite a different man from what he was before. His skin was clear white and red, his body lightsome and free, and when he returned into the hall, he found, instead of his own, a suit, the magnificence of which astonished him. The genie helped him to dress, and when he had done, transported him back to his own chamber, where he asked him if he had any other commands. Yes, answered Alla ad -Din. I expect you to bring me as soon as possible a charger that surpasses in beauty and goodness the best in the sultan's stables, with a saddle, bridle, and other caparisons worth a million of money. I want also twenty slaves, as richly clothed as those who carried the present to the sultan, to walk by my side and follow me, and twenty more to go before me in two ranks. Besides these, bring my mother six women slaves to attend her, as richly dressed at least as any of the princess Budir al Badurj, each carrying a complete dress fit for any sultaness. I want also ten thousand pieces of gold in ten purses. Go and make haste. As soon as Allah ad Deen had given these orders, the genie disappeared, but presently returned with the horse, the forty slaves, ten of whom carried each a purse containing ten thousand pieces of gold, and six women slaves, each carrying on her head a different dress for Allah ad Deen's mother, wrapped up in a piece of silver tissue, and presented them all to Allah ad Deen. Of the ten purses, Allah ad Deen took four, which he gave to his mother, telling her those were to supply her with necessaries. The other six he left in the hands of the slaves who brought them, with an order to throw them by handfuls among the people as they went to the sultan's palace. The six slaves who carried the purses he ordered likewise to march before him, three on the right hand and three on the left. Afterwards he presented the six women slaves to his mother, telling her they were her slaves, and that the dresses they had brought were for her use. When Allah ad Deen had thus settled matters, he told the genie he would call for him when he wanted him, and thereupon the genie disappeared. Allah ad Deen's thoughts now were only upon answering, as soon as possible, the desire the sultan had shown to see him. He dispatched one of the forty slaves to the palace, with an order to address himself to the chief of the porters, to know when he might have the honour to come and throw himself at the sultan's feet. The slave soon acquitted himself of his commission, and brought for answer that the sultan waited for him with impatience. Allah ad Deen immediately mounted his charger, and began his march, in the order we have already described. And though he never was on horseback before, appeared with such extraordinary grace, that the most experienced horseman would not have taken him for a novice. The streets through which he was to pass were almost instantly filled with an innumerable concourse of people, who made the air echo with acclamations, especially every time the six slaves who carried the purses threw handfuls of gold among the populace. Neither did these acclamations and shouts of joy come from those alone who scrambled for the money, but from a superior rank of people, who could not forbear applauding Allah ad Deen's generosity. Not only those who knew him when he played in the streets like a vagabond did not recollect him, but those who saw him but a little while before hardly recognised him. So much were his features altered. Such were the effects of the lamp as to procure by degrees to those who possessed it perfections suitable to the rank to which the right use of it advanced them. Much more attention was paid to Allah ad Deen's person than to the pomp and magnificence of his attendants. As a similar show had been seen the day before, when the slaves walked in procession with the present to the sultan. Nevertheless, the horse was much admired by good judges, who knew how to discern his beauties, without being dazzled by the jewels and richness of the furniture. When the report was everywhere spread that the sultan was going to have the princess in marriage to Allah ad Deen, nobody regarded his birth, nor envied his good fortune, so worthy he seemed of it in the public opinion. 
End of section 19.